Welcome to PLC Professor's Workshop. Today we're going to do a quick little video on building one of these. This is a digital field device simulator and it simulates six inputs and six outputs. Rather than buying one of these, you can make your own. So what we're going to do, and there's two ways you can do that. This particular box right here, which is uh, pre-machined and printed, is something you can buy from our website, but you don't have to buy this from us. You can buy just the plain box, find your components, lay out the cover, and uh, you know bore all the holes in it. Notice there's some holes in one end for the power connectors and for the fly-out leads. So you can buy a plain box online like this for $30, $40, mark it up, bore your own holes, buy your own components. I'm gonna show you enough so you're going to have a good idea of what to buy. What we want to end up with is getting close to this. So we actually are going to take and mount the components, the major components, and discuss the entire assembly process. So let's get at this. Over the years, I've built quite a few of these digital field device simulators. As a matter of fact, we have some videos on YouTube showing you how to build some of the early models where we actually had a controller mounted right on the box with the lights and switches. So what we're looking at here is lights and switches. Now it's a little bit more complex than just that because these are push buttons and these are toggle switches and each pair is one input circuit. And then the LEDs behind the lenses are the outputs. So this box supports six digital field device combinations. So six digital input field devices with the switches and then six digital output field devices with these six lights. I am no longer going to build these boxes. So what I'm going to do instead, because I still have access to the machined and printed boxes. You can see there's three holes machined in this end, and then there's a number of features on the front, and then it's all printed with the labels. Now you could buy this box yourself. Mark it all up, drill all the holes in it. Of course, I'd advise buying your components first, so you put the holes in the right location with the right spacing. So all that you're getting from me, if you buy this box, is a machined and printed box with some instructions where to specifically find these parts. And if you, just from watching this video, if you then took it on yourself to go find these parts, those hours alone would be considerable to find those parts and make sure that you had the right voltage, the right dimensions, etc. You would find you save a lot of money just by buying the box and then getting the document that explains how to go online and find these components and specific example. We're not going to sell you the components, but in the instructions that come with this box, there will be examples. And these examples are all taken from uh, websites that you will recognize immediately when you look at the example. So I'm going to set this aside and start working on this box. Now I'm not going to wire it up. All I'm going to do is talk about the components and mounting the components. In the instructions that come with the box, there are schematics of how to build this box. First thing we want to do is we want to disassemble the parts. It's always a good thing to disassemble the parts before you get going here. And you're going to use a socket anyway to tighten them up, so you might as well get it out in advance and use it to loosen up the nut so you can slide off the components, the hardware, and get it out of the way. And then take and tighten the second nut all the way down tight against the base of the switch. This part right here, this locking collar, if you want to call it that, there's a key on it that fits into a slot on the switch, so it's anti-rotation. 
and then there's a little tab on there that if you drill a small pilot hole next to each switch hole, you're going to be able to put that in there so the switch doesn't rotate much. I never use these. I always throw these away, and then I just use the star washer and the nut to hold it in place. So I'm going to start by putting one toggle switch on, and I hold it against the back with my fingers. You'll sort this all out as you do them. Slide on the star washer and then slide on the nut and lightly rotate it until it grabs the threads and then spin it on finger tight. Try to avoid scratching up the face of your box. A few scratches aren't going to hurt anything. And then use your socket to snug it down. Okay? Now, and later on you can take and make it more square as far as alignment goes. Okay, I'm going to install the other six toggle switches. Once I have all seven toggle switches mounted and finger tight, then I take the socket and socket wrench and put it on there and just turn it just enough so it's nice and tight, so they don't turn easy. And you can see you can always take them and twist them just a little to line them up. You line them up, and there you have it. Toggle switch is mounted. Next, we're going to mount the push buttons, the LED push buttons. And the reason I put toggle switches in first is because if I do these first, it gets in the way of tightening these down. So I'm going to drop the, the push button, backlit push button in. And it's round, so it doesn't matter how it goes in from the front. It will from the back, and I'll show you in a minute why. I drop the locking ring on it and I rotated it around, I want the common solder lug for the push button part of the device to be on this side, not on that side. Because I'm going to daisy chain the 24 volt DC from common to common to common. I don't want to clutter up this space. So I always mount them with the plus LED at the top and the minus at the bottom. Remember this is the top and this is the bottom. So put my locking collar back on there. My locking washer, I guess you would say it has four sharp points on it that dig into the plastic. So I'm going to crank this down by hand and I want it lined up so the negative side of the LED is at the bottom. Tighten it up and you'll notice that these locking collars have notches on one side. So you want to be careful that you put the notches out this way, not in. The smooth side goes down and those notches are so you can put something in there and give it a one last little push to tighten it down. Now I'm going to mount the others. And there we have most of the major components mounted on the cover. Six toggle switches and six backlit push buttons. Actually, seven toggle switches, six for inputs and one for power on off. We also have an opening for a 24 volt DC pilot light, so we'll discuss that next. Typically, what people end up using are something like this because they are metal, they seem more substantial. However, we purposefully use a smaller opening that this type of LED pilot light will fit into. And I actually prefer these because they're smaller and we need just enough light to show that there's power. But this is what people end up with in a lot of cases. So you may have to bore out this hole using every electrician's favorite tool, the Unibit. And the Unibit slides in there and you can see the next size up. You power this. You could even do it by hand by twisting and you can step this whole size up one step at a time. Be really careful. You get too aggressive and then you got a sloppy hole. Another spot where you might use this tool is these holes right here that are for the uh, power connectors. We make these to fit the smallest one available, not the largest. Otherwise, the rings, the uh, nut and the lock washer that fits on the back end up getting pushed into the hole. So... A unibit is a good thing to own, and you may have to enlarge these two holes and maybe this one, depending on what you buy 
for pilot lights. Remember, we're not showing you the parts, uh, but in the instructions that come with this box are examples, and you'll recognize immediately where to go to find these. Okay, there are other lights that you might get, like this. This one's also too big. It won't fit in that hole, but you can bore it out. This one will fit in the hole. However, these are more fragile than either one of these two. So these two are your best choices. This one's probably the most robust. All of them do have some thermal sensitivity on these solder lugs. So it's a good idea to solder your leads on there before you mount it in the box. And remember that the LEDs inside of these are also soldered to that same piece of metal. So if you overheat the metal, the LED leads can fall off inside and then you got a piece of junk. Okay, these are your bulkhead connectors and these are very specific size. And by the way, when you are soldering the leads on these, you want to be sure and put a plug inside of it when you do that. That way, if you apply excessive heat to the center uh, solder lug there, and you soften the plastic, you won't displace the center pin. Then once it's cooled, then you can pull out the plug and you're good to go. Now, I'm using a red, four green, and a amber. In the past, I've used an amber and a blue. And the thing about the blue, and this looks nice, right? Except it's got a white LED in it. And guess what it looks like when you power it up? Like a dirty white light. It's really ugly. So I would avoid the blue ones. If you can find them that have a blue LED behind the blue lens, that's good. This, these have red, green, and amber LEDs behind the lens. You can also use the square units. Now, the white is not very attractive, but these three, just like with these, they're, they're fairly attractive when they're lit because they're basically the same product. The reason I don't typically use these is because it's more difficult to get these settings square and lined up real nice in the holes where with round, uh, even if you didn't put them in square like we wanted you to on the back with the plus side on the top and then negative side on the bottom, perfectly square, it's still going to look good on the front. The reason that we have two openings here is so you can mount two of these connectors. Now these are the ones that uh, fit in there perfectly, but there is a size larger. And the reason there's two here, they're wired in parallel, and that is so you can put in a jumper like this, and you can jumper it to another fill device simulator right next to it, whether it's another digital one or one of the analog ones which we also build. That's the reason for two bulkhead connectors. They are wired in parallel and there are other things you can use these for where you want to jumper 24 volts DC out to some other device. Also in the wiring diagram that comes with the box, uh, we do discuss that this on and off switch when you flip it on, this lights up, shows you got power. Now, if you use an appropriate power adapter, you can run 24 volts DC out of this box up to your controller. Most modern controllers require 24 volts DC to power it up. But keep in mind that your power adapter has to have sufficient capacity, the, the ability to deliver amperage at 24 volts DC, volt amperes, to power up the controller's power supply and any additional I.O. that you have up there. So you can wire this up to your controller so this turns on and off the entire learning station. One of the issues that you run into in building stuff like this is wire management. There's a multitude of red wires and black wires for hot and common or 24 volts DC and zero volts DC. Now, when I build these, I manage to do it very carefully without using any terminal strips. You may need to use terminal strips, which you can mount in the bottom of the box and then run your wires down here for your commons, or you can use something like this. And I tried to hot melt these together, didn't work, but some of that UV glue, I think, might. 
but they don't need to be connected together. So what I've attempted to do here is each one of these little devices here, and it's you insert the wire in, then it clamps down, but it's one conductor. All five of these are connected together. So you can run all of your hot wires, your 24 volt DC, you can run the the feed for 24 into here and then come off of here to everything. That's one way you can do it. And then you could do the same thing. I've got a black wire on here for the negative side. And these come in all different uh, combinations. Here is a double connector. They come in triples, quadruples, five, and maybe even larger. So that's one way to do it. Now, if you wire it up the way I do in solder it, which I will show you a little later in the video, if you're really careful, you can do it. One thing you don't want to do is try to put more than one wire in each one of these solder lugs in the toggle switches. And keep in mind that you want everything tinned and cleaned, especially on these toggle switches because they are intolerant of excessive heat. Because remember, the toggle switch is under spring pressure all the time, which means there's always one of these lugs that's being pushed on by the spring. If you soften, soften up the plastic, then the lug and the contact inside displaces, and then you're going to have to replace the switch. These solder lugs are much more tolerant of heat, and they're larger than these. So you can put up to three 22-gauge stranded conductors in here, carefully set them in there, then solder them and trim off the excess. Something we didn't mention yet is this particular opening right here. This is for your fly-out leads. I recommend 30 inches of leads coming out. You can always cut it shorter, but making it longer is more difficult. This is a grommet or a strain relief that you can mount in a hole like this. And when you force it in there, it closes down on the conductors and gives you some strain relief. Now, this is too large for that hole. So if you're not going to use a grommet or a strain relief, you don't want the hole any larger than necessary, and then you put a tie wrap on the outside and right on the inside, and that's your strain relief. These you can buy online, but they're very specific in dimensions. And thickness, you can't see it, but the little locking tabs here are on this particular one are made for something about an eighth of an inch thick, not as thick as this box is. That would still work if you went in really snug. Here's a unit that... Um, is complete, completely wired up. Now remember, we're not going to uh, show you how to wire this up, but it, the instructions that come with the box uh, give you uh, a pretty complete description and diagrams of how to do it. But you'll notice that the two bulkhead connectors are a uh, jumper together or they're soldered in parallel, each to a common black and red that come over here to the switch area. Of course, the black comes over here and joins the black common all the way through the system. And the red goes through the switch, then goes to the pilot light, and goes to the common on all the input of the, the common for the push buttons. And uh, notice that we have an extra red wire in here. And that's for the end user in case they want to uh, connect up power from here to some other 24 volt DC device or they don't want to use these power adapter connectors and they want to bring 24 volts DC in from the controller into the box and still use the on and off switch to turn the box on and off. So that's what the extra red wires for. You don't need that. I mean you're building your own box. You know what you're doing. You get the box, get the schematics, and then any modifications that you want to make, you'll make to satisfy yourself. Now, I do tell you that you need multicolored wires. Now, red and black are good for uh, positive and negative, 24 volts DC, 0 volts DC. And then I use blue for input and green for output. So you've got six green wires coming in to each of the plus side of the LEDs. Then you've got six blue wires that are going from the common on the six toggles out to the input. And of course the toggles are picking either normally closed or normally open on these switches. And you can see that I have three red wires in this solder lug and three black wires in this solder lug. 
These are all 22 gauge stranded and tinned. And remember that these toggle switches, the lugs cannot tolerate a lot of heat. So it's not a bad idea to pre-tin the ends of the wires, put a little dab of solder flux on each solder lug. So as soon as you apply the heat, it cleans it up, that it conducts heat in there quick, melts the solder on both metal surfaces, the wire and the lug, and then you can pull the solder pencil off before it damages anything. So I think you're good to go. Uh, you can also, you know, you can buy your own box, any size you want, mark out the holes, drill them, and uh, use the components that I've showed you. There was one tool that I did not mention, and that was this wire stripper. This is a Greenlee 45,000 and it has adjustable depth and a couple other adjustments on it and this is worth its weight in gold i think they're 35 bucks something like that but you definitely want one of these if you're going to do a lot of project building we thank you for joining us in the workshop and hopefully you can have your own digital fill device simulator and uh, keep in mind that the one that the box that we sell, we include the instructions with it, where to go find all the components and schematics and everything. You don't need any of that. You've seen enough in this video that you know what kind of components you need, what kind of box you need. Enjoy.